Okay, we're back. We're live. It must be Monday. Uh, today we're going to do West of Asia. That means the Middle East here on ThinkTech. And our special guest who joins us by Skype from Turkey, from Istanbul, is uh, Russell Kekoa Kohler. Welcome to the show, Russell. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, it's to wonderful to, to have you at such great distance, half away, half around the world. And that, if it's 11 o'clock here, then it must be 11 o'clock in Istanbul, eh? Yeah, it's actually 12.20 right now. Okay, it's... all right. Well, all right. <laughs> Thanks for staying up for us. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, and we're going to call this, uh, you know, the migrants cross Turkey because that's a big piece of news these days. You know, Turkey seems so close to Syria. It's right on the border. It's a natural. And, and I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I guess uh, if you want to go to Europe, you'd pretty much have to cross through Turkey to get there from, from Syria. Am I right? Yes, it's definitely the easiest way. It's the only land route besides going through uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia, then through Russia. But uh, no one in their right mind would, would do that currently. Well, why, why is that? Is it because of, of, uh, of the Russians, uh, of Putin? Or is it because it's very difficult to pass through that, that territory? It's very difficult to pass through that territory. It's always been a natural uh, border because of the geography there. It's very mountainous, as well as the Russian migrant policies that are very strict. Okay. Let's, uh, let me just get a handle on, on who you are, Russell. You're a recent graduate of HPU, um, and you graduated, what, a year ago or so in international relations, yeah? Uh, how yes. was it at HPU? How was it in international relations? And what motivated you to leave Hawaii for which you are, you were born and raised here, yeah? Leave Hawaii yep. and wind up in Istanbul. That is half away around the world, yeah? <laughs> yeah, the, my experience at HP was, was wonderful. The professorship there was, uh, was highly qualified and they're wonderful people. I loved speaking with the professors. Uh, my decision to come over to Turkey was actually by accident. Um, when I was uh, discussing my study abroad with my advisors, I planned on going to Lebanon or Jordan or actually Egypt in the more Arabic Middle East. But of course, that was 2012 when the Arab Spring was at its height. And so everyone was uh, convincing me not to go. That includes the State Department. So uh, they told me of this great partnership school that HPU had, Coach University in Istanbul. I said, you know, it's close enough. And when I went there and I, I studied there for a year, it should have been my first choice. It was a fascinating, fascinating uh, year abroad where I fell in love with the culture, the history, and of course became entranced in the, in the political and social dynamics of the country. Were you there when uh, they had all that trouble in, um, what, what's the name of the square? The square? Oh, yeah, in Taksim, Taksim Square. Ta Taksim yes, I was Square, there. yeah. I was where Erdogan uh, became an anti-hero. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I was actually there for both the Gezi Park protests, which was, uh, which was the square protests, as well as the December corruption scandal protests. And they were all very eye-opening to me. Yeah, you know, I was there too. I'm not kidding. I oh, was really? there at the time at Taksim Square. I was there in the, in the Shangri-La Hotel, which was right next to the prime minister's um, residence or office rather his office oh, wow. in istanbul um and the police were there all around the hotel and it was pretty scary because af after a few days of um you know of fun riding uh it became less fun and they, yeah. were, they were pulling the lettering off the hotel and painting the walls around the hotel and the hotel was like you know it was it was it was nailed down now and it was not so much a holiday anymore. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Uh, there are many stories of, of co-workers I had, of, of friends that I've had that, that got caught up in the protests and were actually tear-gassed. Some were hit by the water cannons. Um, so it was the school made an effort to really protect us and keep us away from that, uh, from that environment. But yeah, quite interesting. You did want to go, though, didn't you? You did want yes, to go I, to Taxim Square and see what was going on, participate I, with all the kids. I actually, I actually did get a chance to, to go down to the square, and this was actually during the quiet time uh, of the protests. Uh, and in the square, they, the protesters had actually blockaded 
all of the exit points. And so at that time, there was no government control, no police control. It was purely anarchy, I guess, in the purest sense, where people were selling things, drinking openly, having fun, chanting. There were communists and fascists and, and Republicans and, and, and <laughs> Islamists and, and all sorts of people. But it was, it was a fascinating, fascinating time. Yeah. Well, as a, a student of international relations and a student of society, kind of a modern day anthropologist, that must have been fascinating for you to see the way it all came together. Oh, definitely. And seeing it all come together was an extremely interesting event where I got to, I had the opportunity to talk to all of these Turkish students who were participating, Turkish professors that were, that were experts in their field in this, in this area. Um, and what was probably more fascinating was watching the, the real devolution of the protests and watching the government really clamp down on everything. And by summer's end, it was, it was like it never happened. Yeah, it's so interesting. It was like, you know, in the evening time, uh, the protesters would pick up the, the, the paver bricks from the streets and throw them at people and things and police mostly. And in the morning, uh, the maintenance guys would come around and put the paver bricks back in the street <laughs> and, and clean all the, all the mess up and everything. You'd start a whole brand new day. It was so odd to, to see the way, the, sort of the rhythm of it every day like that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I, I, you're lucky to have been there at the time. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you, you weren't uh, hurt in any way, but I'm, I, I'm envious of the fact that you could uh, appreciate it from the Turkish point of view. We were, we were locked down, <laughs> and you were able to at least uh, talk it up with your friends. What do you think of, um, what do you think of Turkey? I mean, it's, it's an interesting place because it's right on the divide between Europe and Asia, and you get both influences, but each influence is is filtered, moderated somehow, and sort in a funny way, you get the, boast, the best of both, um, because there's a lot of t tolerance there. I mean, how do you feel about Turkey? Turkey has, has to be one of the most fascinating places I, have, I think I will ever be, have the opportunity to go to. It's, like you said, it's, it's on the cusp of this, of one world and, and a completely different one. Um, and to really understand Turkey, you have to understand both its, its history as the Ottoman Empire, as this sort of Islamic leader uh, back in 100, 100 years ago, actually. And then the uh, reawakening under Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in this new Republican Turkey. He still that casts he, a long shadow, doesn't he? Out of Turk defined modern Turkey. And, and, I hate, and I don't want to be insensitive to any, any Turks, but Ataturk is, is borderline worshipped in this country. Yeah. I mean, he, you see his picture in every cab, in every, in every restaurant, in every house, in every government office. Um, there are people who, hold, who have clocks um, with his picture on it or... or the Turkish flag on it, and it's actually set to the time that he died. Uh, and so it's, he's a, a very, he is the most important figure in contemporary Turkish history. However, as we've seen in the last 10 years, you could potentially say that the current president might be the next most important uh, individual in, in he's, Turkish he history. He certainly thinks he is. Yes. Uh, yeah. Erdogan's really got some personality problems. And uh, he, he, he's been going directly against the tradition of Ataturk. Uh, that was the problem in Taksim Square. He wanted to build, um, as I recall, a, a shopping center there. Um, but it was, um, it was not consistent with the way people felt about Taksim Square. They wanted to preserve, preserve the history of that area of the park there in Taksim Square. <clears throat> so, I mean, is, is Erdogan still, you know, I guess he's still in power, that's for sure. Uh, but is he popular? Is he unpopular? How did the riots affect his popularity? Well, unfortunately, uh, I think a lot of Turkish liberals uh, became disillusioned after the, they, they found that the, the Gezi Park protests in 2013 uh, fell apart. They, they, were, they were crushed by the, by the government. And 
they were further disheartened by the uh, by the result of the corruption scandals um, that had to do with uh, actually Erdogan's son and a couple of deputy ministers. And instead of the accused being being uh, punished, they were actually the central government was actually able to gain more power by rooting out every opposition that there was, according to Erdogan, in this parallel states uh, in, that they had in the government. And so currently, uh, the AKP, or the AKP party that he is uh, previously part of, uh, in this past election, they had 40% uh, still of the national vote, which is a large, large percentage, considering this is a parliamentary democracy. Um, but his popularity over these last five years now has been falling uh, systematically since I believe it was 50% in 2007. So I think Turks are beginning to realize now after two and a half terms, consecutive terms as prime minister, now a year as president and a $350 million presidential palace later that he is a more authoritarian leader. Yeah. Well, has he got a future politically in Turkey? Uh, as, or is he, um, you know, are the people going to throw him out one day? I believe he has a future. Uh, as president, he is, as president, he's given more ability to, um, to, keep his, to keep his position. Because now, according to the changes in the Turkish constitution from these last couple of years, the Turkish president is elected directly by the people instead of appointed by the uh, parliament. So now he can use his popularity that he currently has and really just win uh, an election against anyone who comes up against him. Because uh, in the country now, there's no single person that can defeat his personality, his influence, and his stature in Turkish politics. And he has achieved some business advantages for Turkey. He's built a lot of things. He's, uh, he's, he's created a prosperity in Turkey, which I guess still exists. Um, so people give him credit for that, yeah? Yes, I mean, uh, in 2002, when the AKP party was actually elected into parliament, uh, they, you know, it, it was the first time really in Turkey's new 80 year history since 1923 that uh, the conservative working class person had a voice in the Turkish government. And so this was a new step for Turkey and they, the AKP under, uh, at that time, Abdullah Gül, uh, because Erdogan was actually banned from politics at that time, uh, actually gave a voice to these people that previously had never had a chance to um, to have a say, to have a say in the government. And so we've seen in the last uh, 10, 12 years that how everything's changed and it's really due to this, to this new voice in Turkey rising up. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you, you have a, a country that's on the cusp, as you say, between Europe and Asia, a country that in many ways is European, but also understands the Middle East. Uh, we, we had a host here, an Israeli, who uh, always said to me that, um, you can't understand Middle Eastern politics uh, without understanding Turkey. Turkey is kind of a cap on all of it, historically and in a funny way economically. Uh, so you must understand Turkey. It's critical. So here you are, uh, and you see this, you know, this situation, this set of circumstances. And then we add fuel to the fire. We add lots of migrants coming over uh, from Syria. We're going to take a short break, Russell. I'm going to come back and I'm going to ask you how, how, what kind of a welcome they have had. Uh, we know that uh, Turkey has had issues with the Kurds from the eastern part of Turkey for many years. And now all of a sudden a flood of migrants. So what happens when you add that to the special broth that we have in Turkey? By the Bosphorus. Okay, we'll be right back to talk to Russell K. Koa Kohler about the events in Turkey and the migrants who passed through. We'll be right back.
Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. One. We're back. We're live. Uh, we're doing West of Asia with Russell K. Koa Kohler. He joins us by Skype from Istanbul, half a world away. And we're talking about the migrants crossing Turkey. Fabulous discussion. Russell, that's great. Russell is a recent graduate, class of uh, 2014, from HPU, who studied international relations and who's been in school and studying Turkey inside of Turkey for quite a while. Um, so it's a great opportunity. Russell is going to leave Turkey soon. He's going to go back to Washington, D.C. and learn more. You are going to be, you are an international person. It's so wonderful to have you out and about, uh, and we're able to talk to you. We want to talk to you again wherever you are, Russell. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so we sort of defined what Turkey is, and now we have, uh, you know, much more than the problem with the Kurds. Um, I'd like you to talk about that. We have now, what did you tell me in the break, 2.2 million migrants, uh, refugees who want to be in Turkey or go through Turkey. So what happened with the Kurds as a background, and then what is happening with the migrants? Well, right now with um, the Kurdish situation, are you, are you referring to the, the, PK, the current conflict with the PKK or the uh, Kurds that were in Syria? Because there's, it's a huge... You name uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the Kurdish situation has always been a complicated one for, for Turkey. And to even call it a, a Kurdish problem is, is quite controversial here. Um, right now, uh, at least during the tenure of the, of the AKP, uh, Kurds in the East have had actually a, enormous benefits uh, given to them by, by the current government. Um, they've been given uh, more political representation, cultural rights, and they've actually opened Kurdish schools up in the east. But all of that has actually backtracked now recently, um, considering the, the amount of violence that's occurring in, in, the Syrian, in Syria. And uh, because uh, Turkey, the Turkish government, views not only the PKK, which is inside Syria, but the armed militant groups uh, Kurdish groups inside Syria as terrorist organizations, it is it complicates the situation further, because during as I, I believe everybody knows the story of Kobani, where ISIS had had sieged the city and it had been in a four month long siege, and we uh, the United States finally intervenes, um, but the Turks they their borders right across the river, and the reason that they that they didn't. Uh, intervene is because they view the militant groups as terrorist organizations and they would therefore be helping a terrorist organization according to the, the official government's uh, memorandum. Yeah, well, so they say the friend of my enemy, the enemy of my friend is my friend. Mate, the enemy of my friend is my enemy and the friend of my enemy, never mind. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a problem <laughs> because you don't know who your real friend, your real exactly. enemy is. Exactly, and, and a lot of Kurds here have, at least the Kurds that are sympathetic to the, both the PKK and, and the militant groups in Syria, they've become uh, very, very disheartened and, uh, with, the, with the policies of the Turkish government because they view them as supporting more jihadist groups in Syria rather than helping out Kurds, even though Turkey has the largest Kurdish population in the region and is in the midst of a peace process that has really fell apart because of this. And so now what we have is a, the makings of a new war between 
the, Kur uh, the Turkish military and the Kurdish Workers Party, the PKK, in the East. Yeah. So how how does the average uh, Turk how do your how do your students and classmates feel um, about the Kurds? Uh, are they sympathetic to the Kurds? Well, I would say mo in this university in Koç, you have a lot of liberal Turks, and you actually have a lot of a lot of Kurds um, that take uh, classes here, and. For them, it, it is a very um, sympathetic situation because um, while they understand that the PKK is a separate entity to most Kurdish peoples, there is a large population of Turks that still are very, very deeply suspicious of the uh, southeastern population of Kurds that heavily support the PKK. Uh, my roommate, actually, I, I was talking to, I was discussing this with her, uh, a couple of days ago, and and she even has still uh, retains that that deep suspicion of not only the PKK, the terrorist organization, of course, but the political party that represents Kurds, the HDP, and so it's a very complicated situation here. And you have all of these arguments of of nationalism and and, and Turkism, and you know these old old traditional. Uh, Kemalists or Republicanists that um, that are really trying to to ramp up the, the nationalist fervor of, of Turkey again. Yeah. What about what about the ISIS um, group? I mean, uh, that must be pretty threatening for Turkey and for the Turks in general. How do people feel about ISIS? Yes. I mean, ISIS I mean, is a is a group that, uh, according to Turks, has only exacerbated the problem, not only for, for themselves, but has actually directly attacked the you know, Turkey. Inside um, Turkey. They did do an attack yeah, a month yeah. or two ago, yeah. Uh, in, in, on July 20th, in, in a town called Suruç, um, they actually, it, which was, a, it's actually a Kurdish area in this town, they, bo they bombed a, a, pro a kind of a rally that they were trying to bring humanitarian aid to Kurds. And... You know, they killed, um, I believe it was um, over 50 people and wounded countless others. And, I mean, Turkey has been facing this now new threat from ISIS ever since 2013. There have been car bombings on the border. There have been uh, multiple attacks on, on Turkish uh, military forces uh, that were guarding this, this previous tomb that was inside Syria. And, you know, it's, it's a situation that they understand... Um, needs to be dealt with. And uh, I guess the only fortunate thing that comes out of, of this pressure from, the, from these attacks is Turkey has finally joined the U.S. coalition to fight against ISIS and uh, have actually allowed the United States to use the Injilik uh, airbase to, to uh, attack ISIS targets inside Syria. Ah, it's not, it really strikes me that the attack... Um by ISIS on Turkey was foolish because it was likely to provoke that kind of response, no? Exactly, and, and you know, there, I don't know how, um, how far this goes up into the ISIS uh, stru bureaucratical structure, but you know, there have been calls for, you know, calling Erdogan, who is, for all, a lot of Turks, a, an Islamist, or, or in the extreme case, of course, they call him, you know, Satan, they call him an infidel. They call him all of these things that um, really represent what they think about Turkey as as a whole. And and I think I think the country and the government understands that you know if the regime falls, if the Assad regime were to fall, um, and or if it were to the conflict were to exacerbate, it would only spill over into Turkey. And so it needs to be dealt with now rather than much later. Yeah. And Turkey's not to be trifled with. It has a strong army. It has a strong police force. It has a history of successful uh, engagement in war. Am I right? Uh, and, and so uh, that makes um, ISIS foolish on still another level. Exactly. I mean, Turkey actually has the second largest land army in NATO. Uh, of course, the first being the United States. But um, it's a very, very foolish thing to have antagonized the, the, the Turks into, into now getting into a, into a conflict, because now, 
um, Erdogan and Putin actually just met in Moscow this past week, and there have been rumors that they've been negotiating a new peace process in Syria where uh, Assad actually stays as part of the process but leaves at the end. And so, therefore, they would work in conjunction with this new coalition to then combat ISIS. So it seems as though the group has a, a definite life expectancy. What do people think of the Russians now that the Russians are getting more active? They're um, putting bases in Syria. They're you know, taking affirmative steps they didn't take before. Putin has put it up higher on his priority list. Uh, and he's not in any way helping the U.S. effort there. Uh, in fact, it seems like he's, um, you know, uh, further destabilizing things. But what do the people in Turkey think about it? You know, it's interesting. Uh, most, most Turks, they, they don't have a, a real general opinion about, about Russia because it, it's, the Russian-Turkish relationship is one of the more interesting dynamics in the region. It's one where you have this very adversarial conflict in Syria where the Turks heavily support the, the opposition groups and the Russians heavily support the Assad regime. But in other sectors, in, in energy and in trade, both countries are increasing their cooperation with each other. And so it, it's, it's really a conundrum to, to see how people um, really approach, the, I guess, the, the Russian problem in, in this country. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe they see uh, Russia as um, you know, engaged in a bit of a game here and that it's only temporary. Uh, posturing, if you will, uh, maybe posturing against the United States. Whatever we do, they got to do something different. Whatever, whatever benefits us, they have to do the other thing. <laughs> so, so, you know, if I were a Turk, maybe I'd say, well, those guys, you know, they, <laughs> boys will be boys. <laughs> we know that in the end, you know, we'll still have energy and whatever else. We'll have a relationship with Russia because they need us and we need them, yeah? <laughs> But, but actually, Turkey has a very robust relationship with the U.S., doesn't it? Although they didn't come into the fray here against ISIS right away, uh, fact is we've had a very long and uh, nutritious relationship with them uh, going way, way back. Uh, and uh, that you must feel a lot of pro-Americanism around, no? It's very, it's, it's, it's quite a duality of opinion on the United States and in, in, in Turkey. Uh, a lot of Turks, well, they they view Americans themselves as very positive. I, I, haven't, I haven't felt any true anti-Americanism where somebody's that, that's because up. you're That's because you're uh, Hawaiian, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had a lot of conversations about that, actually. <laughs> but I haven't had any real threats or, or, or dirty looks, really. I mean, Turks are extremely friendly towards, towards Americans from, you know, from my view, and and it's really when it comes to the policies of the U.S. government, on the other hand, that's where the criticism lies. And it's, it's the same, actually, with the Turkish government. Uh, the Turkish government, how they view Americans, is rather positive. The individual American comes over, spends their money, you know, it's great. Um, but the policies of the Turkish government, however, they may disagree. And Turkey has, in the last 10 years, has really pursued an independent foreign policy away from... NATO away from um, kind of traditional alliance structures. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take another break, Russell. Uh, when we come back, I'd like to ask you your opinion about hmm, what's going to happen. Hoo -hoo. Prognostications. Uh, <laughs> prognostications from Russell Kekoa Kohler, an HPU alumni, uh, alumnus, and we'll be right back after this break to talk to him further. Aloha. My name is Jim Sean, and I'm host of a show called Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. Each week, live streaming at noon on Think Tech Hawaii, we interview people who have special insights into education from early education through K-12, all the way through higher education and beyond. Both public and private are areas we're interested in. We dig deeper, we try to find out uh, what it's really like to be involved in making change, advocating for it, how you reform, what people's philosophies are in reforming it. 
Uh, as I said, we're live streaming every Wednesday at noon on Think Tech Hawaii. And later on, you can find these interviews on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center website. We hope you join us as many times as possible. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here by Skype. Uh, Russell Kekoa Kohler, HPU alumnus, joins us from Istanbul, which is a great place to be. You know, I mean, although there's threatening things happening around it, the fact is the country has a lot of strength and integrity, and it's, it's worth living there, right, Russell? Oh, very much so. Uh, this place is absolutely stunning. Uh, it has everything you can, you can hope for, no matter what kind of person you are, whether you love history, environmental uh, beauty, if you love people, partying, anything, uh, you'll find it in Turkey and you'll be safe. It, it's a wonderful country. Yeah. You know, one thing I noticed when I was there a couple of years ago at the time of the Taksim uh, Square riots was that uh, the young couples held hands in the street. That is something, considering it's a half Muslim country. <laughs> they hold hands in the street. What could be wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and and actually, you know, Turkey is uh, is actually at ninety eight percent a Muslim country, and you have my first uh, perspective, or not perspective, my first perception on Turkey when I was first going uh, traveling there two years ago was uh, a very different perception. I was I was thinking I was going to a very traditional, very conservative country a lot of conservative values, and it took one night in Taksim, as you say, to completely destroy that notion. Um, I, I saw everything, anything you, you would see in an American city or a European city. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And the food's good. Oh, the food is delicious. <laughs> so you know, the word that comes to my mind when I think of Istanbul and Turkey is vitality. I saw a lot of vitality. Is there a word that comes to your mind to describe what Turkey is for you? Confusion. Frustration. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Confused vitality. <laughs> okay, let's get, uh, let's get down to the end of our discussion. We did have a, we did have a tweet from Mark Ward. He, he wanted to know what is the, what is the average uh, person's uh, man on the street, woman on the street view of the United States. And we, we covered that. But thank you for the question, Mark. Uh, there is no consensus. This is the answer. Um, but <clears throat> let's let's talk about the future. I mean, and as, as you say, uh, Russell, it's a complicated situation, and it's complicated to figure out what the future is going to be. There's so many vectors, you know, just just lining up the vectors we talked about in the show. There's the Turks, and that means the European Turks and the Muslim Turks. There's the Kurds. There's ISIS. I, uh, there's Syria. <laughs> There's, there's Assad, there, and there's Europe, I suppose. You know, there are erstwhile partners in the p potential NATO relationship, who knows? There's the US, there's Russia, so many vectors and factors. The whole Middle East is a vector and factor, you know, on what happens in Turkey. But making it, you know, make it easy for us, will you? <laughs> tell, us, tell us what's gonna happen there in the next few years. Well, as you said, it's, it's, it's a very, very complex and, and comp, uh, complicated uh, set of issues that, that Turkey has to deal with. I mean, it's, it's not just the, the uh, external issues that they're having to deal with. It's also the internal issues with their own political system, with their own, with, uh, they're actually having a new round of elections uh, come November 1st uh, because they, they failed to find a coalition in this, in this previous government. Uh, and so in the next couple of years, what you'll find is probably a lot of the same, a lot of the same in Turkey. You'll, you'll probably find a, a Erdogan who is, who is still president. Um, his popularity is right now going nowhere. Um, as long as he keeps uh, the, presidential, uh, the presidential seat and, and refrains from campaigning towards uh, a prime minister again, then um, he, he'll stay there. Uh, the AKP, uh, they still have 40% of the vote uh, in Turkey. And so uh, it seems to me uh, in this current situation, people will not want to drastically change the, the, the trend um, to another party amidst this, this chaos. Uh, and when it comes to the Kurdish situation, um, it seems to me as though that it, it's becoming more and more likely that there will be another war 
in the east uh, with the Kurds, uh, the Turkish government, as well as the PKK, the, the Kurdish Workers' Party, the terrorist organization, has done no favors for each other. Uh, they've, they've only exacerbated the, the fighting and revenge attacks against each other, and the more people that are killed on both sides, the more likely it is that people will not want the conflict to end. Uh, and regarding Syria, that's, <laughs> that is a situation that um, not only involves Turkey on, on, a, uh, on, a, on a military side and diplomatic side, but it, it forces Turkey to, to really uh, constrain itself in its own policy considerations of the region. I mean, currently, we even the United States is talking about a, a buffer zone um, for for the Syrian refugees, would which would greatly help the the Turkish refugee situation, considering more and more refugees are coming into the country. Uh, I, like like we said before, according to the UN Refugee Agency, there's 1.6 million registered refugees, but unregistered, it's up to 2.2 million in the country, um, and that's that's. Expensive. Exactly. It's not only expensive, but it's far greater the, the scale compared to that that the EU and the United States is facing regarding the migrant situation. So these couple of these next few years are going to be crucial in, in Turkey's development uh, for the next 50 years, really. Well, Turkey is not taking them in. It's not making them citizens. It's not giving them permits. It's keeping them, uh, you know, contained. Uh, and at the same time, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but I guess a lot of the people who are coming into Turkey as migrants are leaving Turkey at the West End and going to Europe. And that's one, that's one pathway to uh, all the migrants who are heading to, uh, to Western Europe. Am I right? Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's, it's a situation where a lot of many, many Syrian refugees are coming in and realizing that Turkey no longer has the infrastructure to, to handle more refugees. And so they're fleeing, rightfully so, for their, for their lives, their, their families, um, into, into the EU. And um, actually, many Syrian refugees have now been given, because of the, the length of time they've been in Turkey, they've been given uh, partial work status, partial residence status, so they can actually assimilate into Turkish society and work, which has actually created a a polarization uh, between Turks in the East, Kurds in the East, and, and Syrian refugees who are now working for, of course, much, much less than the normal Turkish citizen. Oh, complications. Exactly. So if, if I'm a, a refugee, in a, say, in a refugee camp in the East, uh, can I just get on the highway and walk west? Uh, what's the process by which I can um, escape that camp, leave that camp, and go uh, into the soft underbelly of, of the EU? Un unfortunately, it's, it's far too easy to be able to get around the Turkish uh, refugee infrastructure and really travel through the country um, relatively easy. Uh, the lira is it's not that hard to, to make some money in Turkey. Uh, um, migrant workers work every day. You can find uh, work as an unskilled laborer fairly fairly simply, and you work your way over to the border, and depending on how you want to get to, to Europe, you either face the Bulgarian border where you, where you find border police and, and, and the military, or you take what has now been become infamous is, is the Aegean route, which a lot of Turkish children, I mean, uh, uh, excuse me, Syrian children and, uh, and people have, have been drowning. Yeah. Well, you know that is an interesting problem. That if now if they can't if they can't leave if they can't get into Bulgaria, uh, then it, you know uh, they can have all the aspirations they want, but they're stuck, and that means as far as the ones in Turkey are concerned, they're stuck in Turkey, and and Turkey is stuck to take care of them and to spend the money, uh, you know, to provide you know basic life support for them uh, over an indeterminate period of time. Where is that Where is that going to end up, Russell? Unfortunately, not very, not very well for, for the Turkish government. Uh, according to a deputy minister, deputy prime minister, Turkey has already spent 7.6 billion dollars on the refugee crisis, 
And as more refugees come in, because the regime is, is, is massacring people in Syria, uh, it's, it's only going to get worse. In Istanbul, it's, it's the first time, really, that I've seen entire families on the street sitting down with signs saying, help, I'm from Syria. And you know, many people here, they're used to just walking by beggars on the street. It's, it's a normal part of life. But it's become more prevalent uh, in Istanbul, which is really the last bastion of, of kind of, of this conflict. Yeah. Well, you're leaving shortly for Washington, D.C. to try your hand at uh, international uh, relations and diplomacy and, and uh, be, be an analyst in that regard. And I, that sounds great. I'd love to meet you there and say hi, but we'll try to do that by Skype. In any event, will, will you come back to Turkey? Do you have a special affinity for Turkey? Uh, do you feel that um, you know it, it's going to continue to be an attractive place for people like you? Oh, very much so. Um, I fell in love with the country when I came here in 2013, and, it, and when I left uh, in 2014, it really the Turkey the, the the country really never left me, and so I will be back here. I'm already planning to come back next summer. Um, here for either holiday or maybe a work opportunity, but it's it's a country right now that is is probably dealing with uh, the most foreign policy issues of importance uh, in the world today. Yeah, and is in the region and is one in one of the most important regions of the world today. Yeah, so it's it's always going to be fascinating. Yeah, Russell K. Kohler, Kohler HPU alumnus. Um, it's great to see you there and thriving there. Uh, I hope we get a chance to talk to you again soon. Uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii. We're doing West of Asia with Russell. Uh, we're talking about the migrants crossing Turkey. Really appreciate the, the Skype call at, at um, what is it now? It's almost 1 o'clock. It is 1 o'clock yes, in the morning. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Russell. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.